Okay, well, thank you for inviting me here to speak today. Um, it's such a pleasure to accept this invitation. Um, I just want to say that this is the biggest room of people that I've spoken to, so bear with me if I, if I get a little bit nervous. Um, Phoenix Art Museum is the first museum that acquired my work, so this place really does hold, um, it's, a, it's a special place and a special feeling every time that I come back here. And um, I think you always remember your first, I, you know, I'm really good friends with the person who um, first collected my work, and so it, it kind of all, it all goes together into this special place. Um, so when I attend artist talks, I, I always like to have a little bit of background about the person. Nancy kind of did give you some of the background on me, but I want to go into that in a little bit more detail. And I kind of like love hearing where people came from and, and kind of what formed their early thinking. Um, you know, we are all molded by our experiences. And for me, my art definitely pulls from that place as well as from history and from current affairs. Okay, so I was born in Nottingham in the UK, and here are my parents. Um, my mum moved to the UK when, when she was 13, and I just want to highlight these terrible shorts that my dad <laughs> has got on. I, I still, to this day, I'm trying to work out whether he actually just wore them to wear them or whether he had actually just left the tennis court. Um, and then there's this wonderful gust of wind that appears to have gone up my mum's dress, and I have this like, little demon-like expression on my face. Um, that's a terrible photograph. Um, but I add this in because it kind of really touches on my understanding of race um, from a young age, having this multiracial heritage and upbringing, and it kind of really molded my understanding of myself uh, of race, and to a degree, the possibilities and restrictions um, from society. And kind of growing up in the 80s and 90s in the UK kind of gave me this multicultural foundation um, to be able to articulate my identity today. And I, I kind of just want to say as well that I feel like this, this kind of hope of multiculturalism is kind of was relatively short-lived. And so I feel like I kind of live in this kind of snippet of time where, where, where there was this oneness or this feeling of oneness. Um, Stuart Hall, who... Um, was a Jamaican-born cultural theorist. He's written some wonderful essays on the black experience in the UK. And he writes about making sense of the private, the understood and not understood close-up experiences, and the wider social and cultural political forces. I think about moving to the States, and there's really been this different reality to my existence here. And I think of it as, as this idea of encountering the other self kind of being two entities in two different places. Um, I returned back home um, for a brief visit in October last year, and I was thinking how this kind of idea has been further cemented for me, and kind of knowing that I'm seen in a different way and that I actually feel differently in different places. Okay, so here are some words that I think about in my practice. Okay, so I chose photography, or maybe it chose me, um, but I came to art relatively late in my mid, well, I would say late, but in my mid-30s. And I've been living, <laughs> I've been living um, in the States for eight years, and that's really the exact amount of time that I've dedicated myself to making art. And I came from an advertising career background. Nancy mentioned that my first degree was in public relations from Leeds University. And I kind of went into this industry and I was account handler. I wasn't in the creative side of things. And I, you could almost say I was like bumbling through my life a little bit. I had all these nice things. I had my nice cars and my nice clothes. But there was definitely something missing. And I didn't really know what that was. And there was this catalyst for change which was kind of randomly one night, I woke up from a dream, or maybe it was actually a nightmare, um, and I had this question in my mind, and it was a really broad question, and the question was, it's a really depressing question, but the question was, if I was to die today, would I have, would I have lived the life that I wanted to live? And the answer was, was no. 
And I started to think about that moment in time, and I was in my warm bed, and you realize that you are the master of your own destiny, and that you know, I was going to be the person to blame for not living the life that I wanted to live. And so I kind of started to think about this, and I kind of call it my first life crisis. Uh, I have written, written in my notes here, this, this is your first life crisis. And so I set about changing my life and really thinking about what was important to me. And so I started off with exercise. I ran a marathon in Amsterdam, which is a great place to visit and run a marathon. It's a, five hours, you see the whole city. <laughs> um, I've actually run five more since. It's a great way. It's just like one day, I'm just going to do the whole city. Um, and I spent lots of time, you know, whilst I was running, whilst I was processing this question through and thinking of all the possibilities that I could explore. You know, I ended a long-term relationship that I was in, and after a period of consolidation, I actually went traveling, and I went on this around-the-world trip, um, which took me a year. And during that time, I really began to understand the need to express my creative voice. I met the love of my life in San Francisco, and her name is Janelle, and we are now married. And we actually went back to London for a short amount of time, well, I say short amount of time, but for a year, and then we decided to return to San Francisco, and that's when I really decided to enroll in um, photography at the Academy of Art. Okay, so this is one of the first photographs that I made in 2011 when I came back to San Francisco, and I actually made it probably like two or three weeks before I enrolled in school, so I definitely didn't quite know what I was doing at the time. I just kind of pressed the button and hoped for the best. Um, and this was made using a DSLR, car DSLR camera. Um, and I really love coming back to this photograph, um, because when I printed it out for the first time, I knew that my work was about people and portraits. And it's this connection that really drives my work, which is the human connection. And even in this busy scene, um, there's a visibility and this powerful presence. And I actually made it in the mission in San Francisco, which is the area in which I live. And I'd gone to the park for the day. It was a hot day for San Francisco. And of course, the whole city comes out, and I spotted this band standing on the corner of 18th Street. And I just wanted to approach them, and I just approached them and asked them for permission to make this photograph. And what I really enjoy is the engagement of the, of the young gentleman standing at the back of the image, and the intrigue that he has for me, um, whilst I have this intrigue for him in this scene, and also, the girl on the right-hand side, who is just coming out from behind the guitar. She's hidden, but she's present. Um, and there's so much else going on, which I, I often try and remember what was happening, but I, I truly can't remember what was going on outside of this scene. And it kind of brings me to this love that I have of street, of the street and of street photography. Um, it has such a wealth of expression and so many different people and energy to draw from. And so many of my collaborators I've actually found from chance meetings on the streets of San Francisco. Okay, so my work right now um, kind of sits at the intersection of race and gender, and through it, I've kind of found self-discovery and a meaning to my existence, as well as kind of building this narrative of this historical present. And um, using a quote from John Berger, he says like seeing comes before words. And the photograph to me is this perfect cultural metaphor. As my research kind of deepened into photography and portraiture, I explored through the photograph the historical perspective and the present day realities of the portrait and the face. And I kind of come back to this, this, um, these two words, the historical present. And kind of thinking about addressing and subverting the hidden ideologies. 
uh, in visual images that are powerful and influential. And I have another quote here from James Baldwin. He talks um, about art, and he says, I think about the purpose of art is to lay bare the questions hidden by the answers. And I believe we have this impulse to stare at faces and to search the countenance for revelation. And it, it, there's such a long history in that, in human thought and practice. And thinking about the face and the portrait and ways of seeing, I was drawn to the pseudoscience of physiognomy, which is the reading of the face. And it has these ancient roots um, throughout humanity, from Chinese, Persian, Greek, and Roman empires all believed that faces revealed a person's essence. And even communicated, it's even communicated through language. We face facts, we say face, we're out of face, two-faced, and the idea that the face is the window to the soul. And there's still this lingering sentiment that surrounds the face and its ability to be a signifier of self, um, that your face does denote your character. Um, and in its alteration, you can be seen more sympathetically, stronger, smarter, more attractive. Um, and it's something that really intrigues me. And there's also this important and, and further relationship between brown and black bodies and the pseudoscience. And really, it is no surprise to see how features have been used to other and diminish um, black and brown bodies and faces. And so to this day, the power of the face still holds strong. I guess I kind of do want to touch back on um, the rise of facial recognition technology and kind of thinking about its use, use to control and thinking about how you know, the Chinese government is, is kind of using this kind of facial profiling to kind of restrict and kind of track people. Okay, so silhouettes. So I mean, when I think about photography, I think about light as power, and it has this ability to kind of set this emotional tone of any visual image. And the idea that the detail is always in the exposed part of the photograph, but then I ask myself, is it? You know, without light, there is no photograph. Um, and I really do use light intentionally in my practice to communicate a narrative. Um, there's lots of emotions um, that have been stirred, kind of moving to this country. And when I look back at this project, which I was making from 2013, 2012 to 2014, um, I was definitely exploring this in my work and the tensions that I feel kind of living here of being seen and not seen. So this is the first silhouette that I made and I made this in 2012. And this is Fatu. And I, I kind of want to give you a little bit of information about Fatu because she is, um, she's kind of where it all began. And I met her in a bar in, in San Francisco and she was serving drinks and immediately, kind of intuitively, as soon as I saw her, I knew I wanted to make this portrait with her. And in my work, I'm not looking for a particular type of face. I think I, I'm intrigued by this idea of this narrative that comes through the face, but I myself am not looking for a type of face. Um, I'm definitely working with the African diaspora, and that's kind of, that is kind of like the most important thing for me. And so I asked her if she would sit for a formal portrait with me, and we set up some time, and I invited her to my downtown um, phot photographic studio in the city, and she came to visit me, and we had this beautiful conversation about living in the city. We were both international students, which is, which is a real struggle being here. Um, and as the session went on, it became this very relaxed and organic collaboration. And when we started off, it, we just started off taking like just very kind of, I want to say normal portraits, but very kind of standardized portraits. And I decided that 
I wanted to take a break. And to prevent the lights from overheating, I actually turned off the key light, which is the main exposing light. And we went off, had some water, continued our conversation. And when we returned, when we returned, she actually stood back in position. And I looked through the viewfinder and I saw her silhouetted image. And I knew that this was the photograph that I needed to make. And so we made some fine-tuned adjustments, um, as you do. She agreed to have naked shoulders in the image, and then we made the photograph. And intuitively, I knew that the series was about women from the African diaspora, and that there was this power in the shadow that spoke to the history of portraiture, and it also spoke to a part of myself. I originally shot the first set of images digitally. You can probably tell by the format of this image that, or maybe not, that this is a 35 mil frame. And I made 15 photographs this way. I printed them out at like five inches by five inches, put them into a portfolio book, and, and that, was, that was that. Um, and then I actually showed the work to a curator. My practice technically shifted from this one conversation. And the question that uh, Chris McCall, who is the, the director of Pier 24 Photography, he asked me, he was like, Erica, how large do you want to print these photographs? And I was petrified of him at the time. I want to say, I said, oh, Chris, I want to print them as large as, as I can do, but I was very nervous. And I said to him, you know, I, I want to print them as large as I physically can. And he said, well, can you do this with the photographs that you have right now? And my answer was no. And you know, I cropped into the frame without going into the techniques of it too deeply. Um, the sensor was not a full frame sensor. So I didn't have the visual information to reproduce them at the scale that you see in the galleries. So he was like, well, you, you know what you need to do. You need to go back and reshoot them all. And I can't tell you how daunting that, that felt. Um, that I'm super driven, I'm motivated, of course. And the next day I went back into school and I asked them what camera I could use to kind of render a larger file to print. And, well, unfortunately they wouldn't lend me the $20,000 camera. <laughs> um, at the time I didn't have the access but they actually said that I could use a film camera. And so I had to take a workshop which, in which I learned how to use the Hasselblad, the film Hasselblad. And kind of after that, I really never looked back to digital. And I went back and I reshot the whole project using this film camera. Unfortunately, Fatu had moved on. She'd moved to the East Coast, so I couldn't invite her back. So she's not in the final series. Um, which, is, which is actually a real shame, but due to my insufficient funds as a student, I would only shoot one roll of film per person. And kind of knowing that, that there was this restriction, it really slowed down my process. And it's made me more accurate as a photographer, thinking about the attention to detail, making sure that the lights are in the exact place to rendition these, these beautiful portraits. And I now exclusively shoot film um, for my practice. I do shoot digitally if I'm asked to do an editorial job just because the turnaround is so fast and you know, I'm like a week later, I'll, I'll get my negatives back and scan them and the New York Times is not going to be waiting a week for me. Um, and what actually also happened kind of doing this process was that I gained more detail in the shadow of the images. And so the scale of the work is 45 inches by 45 inches, the print. And I've renditioned the work in one size only. Normally photographers may kind of do three different sizes, and I only wanted one size because the presence of these women needs to be felt at this scale, and that anything smaller was just not good enough. And that I wanted to speak to this language of the silhouette being traditionally a very small piece and kind of using the photograph to enhance the scale and kind of 
representing and presenting this larger than life presence um, for black women. So there's 30 portraits in the series. Um, the number is really of no conceptual significance. Uh, and I actually made more than 40 portraits. I think I actually made like 50. And it's really interesting to go back into that time and think about why I edited 30. Um, and I can't tell you the answer for that, but <laughs> that's the number I decided on. Um, and one of the misconceptions about the project is that the images are in black and white, and they're actually all in color. And color is a, a really important factor in my work. It firstly says that this is a modern image. Color dates photography, and anything that was really made kind of before the 1950s has to be in black and white because that, that was all that was available. And also that much of the negative portrayals of black people have kind of been communicated in black and white. I also think about how color film has been optimized for pink tones and what this means for the exposure and the color balance of brown skin. So I want to talk a little bit about how I found my sitters, stroke collaborators, and I found them in this multitude of ways. The street was my first point of call, of course, and I would set up my lighting equipment in my studio downtown, and I would go outside and literally kind of wait and look and pluck up this courage to ask, to ask people to sit for me. And as I did the process twice, there were some new people that I found, and I was able to also invite people that had already been participated in the first set of images. I also found new ways to, to kind of expand the project, um, and that was as I began to build this community for myself. And all of this time, it kind of took me to rebuild the project using a larger format camera, and it helped me understand in, the, in a greater way what it really meant to me. And kind of, I really furthered my own learning th in this time. What I would do is I would explain the project to my potential collaborators. I would talk about what I really wanted to do and the presence that I wanted for black women, women from the African diaspora to have in galleries um, and for this conversation to be happening. And it was such a rewarding experience to have virtually everyone agree to be in the project. And it kind of really comes, well, I mean, at the time, it was a surprise to me, but I really kind of pushed hard to, to kind of have all ages incorporated um, in the work. It was very easy for me to kind of find young women, but I really wanted the work and the project to be more than just about young women. And really, I think about how many strangers I met making this work and how so many people have gone on to become friends, um, that the studio became this place of community and of learning. And in many ways, it was a safe space to share our experiences and share the space of self-determination and all these other emotions that kind of come through the work. And I really found there was an ethics of care that came into my practice um, kind of through this project and the connections that I made. And, you know, this space was also a space for me. I, I found a new sense of identity, this connection um, to, to the diaspora, to, to kind of to my people and to with this generosity that was given to me by my sitters and a sharing of their own experiences, I gained you know, a deeper understanding of myself and the black experience in the US. Okay, so here is a particular favorite of mine. Um, but I want to think about a word that springs to my mind when I see the work, and this, this word is transfiguration. And that through this contrast of light and darkness, the images reveal almost a complete change of form or appearance into like the spiritual state. Um, 
And I think about how can the traditional portrait really afford this to, to the people within it? And so this is Kyra. She is untitled nine in the series. And she's a particular favorite of mine because she came to me um, through an ad that I placed on Craigslist. And um, there's so many beautiful connections that I made during the project, these random connections. Um, and I really wanted to kind of push myself. And you know, I decided to place this ad on Craigslist. And I, I placed it in the section of women looking for women. And I used my own silhouette in the ad, and I explained the project and invited potential sitters to contact me. And really, the kind of criteria was that, that each person was self-identifying as a woman and that they were from the African diaspora. And I really kind of see that as, as having at least one parent from the African diaspora. And each person would come to my studio in downtown San Francisco. I really wanted to find my silhouette. And I, I was looking through my hard drives, and I just couldn't place it in the time of this presentation. But you know, it was really important for me to kind of share my own entity and image uh, whilst inviting people to come and sit for me. And so Kyra came from the ad, and she had just finished her yoga class in Berkeley. And she came over to me. Berkeley's about 30 minutes away from San Francisco. And I see the time that my sisters give me as this big gift. Um, you know, people take their time to come and help me in this practice and kind of broaden the language, this visual language um, of what we see and how we connect with it. And she had such a deep sentiment for the arts, and she was such an advocate and wanted to support in any way that she could. And once we had parted ways, I actually lost her um, for a few years. And it's always, there's so many people that I'm really in contact with, and then people that I'm loosely con in contact with. And with her, I'd lost her completely. And it wasn't until that I had a random conversation in a camera store that I was working at at the time that um, kind of through an, another person, we were connected again. And I found out that she's now left the Bay and lives in Chicago. What I'm really enamored with in this image is her posture, all that yoga is obviously going to, to great use. Um, there's this beautiful highlight on her shoulder and on her chest, and of course, the dreadlocks of her hair. Um, it's almost like this sculptural piece, um, and yet I really kind of feel her in there, this quiet confidence and power um, yet a sensitivity um, also that sits within the work and within her image. And I actually have this, this piece in my living room. Okay, so this is um, entitled 18 to Shia. She's actually on show in the galleries right now. And this idea that we're still connected through the project kind of really lives through her as she actually visited her portrait at the end of last year. And it fills me with joy to be able to kind of share the work with each person and that the work is this true collaboration. We knew each other from school. She was a fashion major and we would trade skills with each other. I would shoot her fashion images even though I really don't enjoy kind of this model fashion kind of rendition, but I really wanted her to help me in my, in my fine art practice. So we, we had this, this trade going on. And she's such a visionary. Um, I really love her constant change in appearance. Within this photograph, you can see this blonde kind of area at the front of her hair. And this streak, and again, her posture, and the highlight, the highlight on her eyelid. Um, which is sensational. And when I look at her, I, I find this real serenity pass over me. And she now has moved back to New York, and she's kind of working on building her social media empire as a fashion influencer. And it's just really exciting that she kind of made the time and effort to, to kind of come here and visit. And I wanted to say that I entitled the whole series intentionally. 
Um, I felt it was this degree of protection um, that I could grant to each of the sitters, that they still had something that really belonged to themselves. Um, their name, you know, when people kind of look at these images, um, you know, in many ways I think about how the black body has not always belonged to ourselves and how even in this gesture of protection, um, it kind of gave them some ownership of self. And there's tension in each of the portraits and with, this, with there being this limited amount of visual information on show, there's this invitation to see, but also it has these restrictions. And yet the more time you spend with each image, the more detail that you get to see. Okay, so here are a few more images that really speak to me. This is Leo, and they are entitled 25. Leo actually came to me um, as a self-identifying woman and has now transitioned. Um, and so they are actually now in my other series, the Brown series. So um, it's really kind of special, um, a special thing that happened. And this is Pearl. Um, I really adore this image. I really in enjoy the fact that she reminds me of my mum and that I see that within her, within her presentation. This is Jamika. She's entitled 08. And we recently found each other on social media. She is living back in Jamaica. Um, and we actually met at the studios and she was waiting outside of the studio. She was early for her class one day and I kind of invited her in to make this image. And uh, I really enjoy the fact that in this particular image you can see the color of her hair. And so each person would come to me in the studio as they would feel confident themselves. Everyone was very concerned, like, how do I, how do I come and see you? Like, how do I present myself in this portrait? And for me, it was really about each person feeling confident themselves and being able to have a sense of ownership of, of their own bodies. And so I really didn't want to use any makeup artist or stylist. This was really kind of trying to grapple and find this true vision. Uh, this is Julia. She's also in the galleries downstairs. This is Aimee. She's untitled 24. We were actually docents together at Pier 24 Photography in San Francisco. And again, the posing of each of the images um, kind of comes very organically, but of course I'm definitely giving some direction in the work. I think any portrait photographer who says that they do not give direction in their shoots is, is telling a big lie. <laughs> and, um, but it really would be fine tuning. And again, this is Lucia. She's also on show, Untitled 16. And she came um, to me through an internship that I had um, at an organization called Intersection for the Arts in San Francisco. She was the executive director, and I was petrified to ask her, but she completely agreed. And I really love, again, this highlight on her hair, on her gray hair, and how there is this contrast between this youthful image and then her hair, which kind of suggests that she may be slightly older, and how the light kind of gently carves her jawline. And this is City and Title 29. I really feel like I could go on forever looking at them. Um, and this is Kimberly and Title 13. And finally, we'll end on Ruby who is Untitled 23. So I wanted to share this installation shot um, from Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive from a few years ago, where all 30 portraits were displayed in one room. And it really was a special moment um, for me and for the work to be seen in its entirety.
Okay, so with this newfound community that I had built myself, um, I began to build my second project, which is called the Brown Series. And I asked many of my now friends from the Silhouette Series to kind of open up their networks and kind of thinking about photographing men from the African diaspora. And in this series, I feel that I am tackling more head on um, the mugshot and this re repetitious negative depiction of African American men and using that to sub, you know, as a subversive tool um, and creating, a, again, space of safety in each of these images. And so I chose a background close to my own skin color and a lighting technique that rendered my silhouette in the catchlight of each sitter's eyes. And so the catchlight is the reflection in an eye. And um, I really wanted to kind of place myself and connect and kind of join myself into the image with each person. And as for the naked chest, I, I think of this as, as kind of referencing like Western tropes of portraiture, the bust style, thinking of Greek and Roman um, sculpture, but also kind of removing fashion as, as this removal of class and also of time that, that with this kind of Western bust style that these images could almost have this like timeless vision and position. And I'm still kind of thinking, I think I'm always going to be thinking about these themes of history and the portrait and the face and thinking about this reading of the face. And so within this body of work, there's 36 images, which again, I'm trying to think why I choose these numbers, but 36 kind of intuitively um, became the number. And I began working on this in 2015. This is Marvin, and he came to me through Mariah, who is in the Silhouette Project. And I made all of this work in my living room, and so I didn't have access to the studio anymore. I graduated from school, and so I used my personal space and I rented lights to deliver this project. And there's this really kind of intimate and uncomfortable moment of inviting strangers into your home for a formal portrait. And even before we begin making the photograph, there's this period of time where we just both try to become comfortable in each other's company, um, kind of talking about shared interests, talking about the project. And it's really interesting for me to think about how nervous I get making the portrait. I think there's this kind of misconception that because you hold the camera that you have all of the power. But for me, because it's such a collaborative process, I find that I am nervous to share parts of my personality and, and my thinking and spirit. And I really enjoyed listening to two people's stories. Um, it's, it's such an honor to have people open up and share their experiences of life and of living and of just simply being a person. And Mar Marvin had this beautiful story of overcoming childhood trauma to, becoming, to become this inspirational member of his community. And he's also a fitness coach. And we talked about this hyper-visibility and is invisibility that applies to black men. And, and this kind of really made me think about the audience and who is looking at this work and the direction of the sitter's gaze. And I edited the work with this in mind, kind of directing the gaze away from the viewer, um, that really the image doesn't really belong to the person looking at it, that the photographic space kind of belongs to the person in it, and um, that this place is a place of reflection. And so I'm just gonna take you through a few of these images. So this is Mohammed. And I kind of titled everyone by name for this project because I think because of the true visibility of the work, I felt that I didn't want to untitle. By untitling them, I, I kind of made them invisible. This is Zawadi. Orobosa and his wonderful chest tattoo. Yane, he's also an artist in the city. 
Jacques. Jacques is a Vogue dancer in the city and he's another wonderful creative soul. And I'm so honored that I managed to capture him in this real state of calm and contemplation. Um, when people look at this image of him, they're like, how did you get Jacques to be this calm? And I'm like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. I think, well, maybe it is the content and the conversations that we have that make the work so poignant. Maybe that's some of it. And this is an installation currently on view at the San Jose Institute of Contemporary Art. And I kind of wanted to create this immersive space um, utilizing this color brown and thinking about color photography and about representation. Okay, so lastly, I wanted to share with you an editorial project that I worked on for the New York Times called the 1619 Project. And I don't do too many editorial jobs, but this was of such significance um, that I, I really, I, I mean, I had to do it. And it also had this huge impact on my personal projects and my art practice. And so 1619 was the year in which the first enslaved Africans were brought to this country. And the project is this major initiative um, from the New York Times to <coughs> kind of correct the record of reframing the country's history by placing the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Americans at the center of the national narrative. And so for 400 years after enslaved Africans were brought, first brought here, you know, this story is still relatively unknown and kind of un and understood. And in many ways, um, the legacy continues to shape the United States. And so I was invited to kind of make some photographs in DC um, that came from the archive of, national, of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And at the time, they didn't supply me with this kind of vast um, document of information. Um, and so kind of as I learned more about the project, um, it, it has been kind of incredibly humbling to have contributed to it. And I was part of an all-female team. Um, three of us were black women. And as I stood in front of the objects I'm about to show you, um, I kind of really felt this distance and of this journey that we had all traveled and the hope and despair of, of the story that connects us all. And one of the comments that I made before taking on the project was that I didn't want to make any of the objects look beautiful. Again, I was thinking about light as narrative and you know, it was important for the, for the projects to kind of have this communication of the weight of history and what these actually meant to people and to how society is constructed. And so we agreed on the following, and this is how the images were rendered, and um, I really believe that it kind of does communicate this fraught legacy of these artifacts. And so I want to read some information about each piece um, kind of thinking about this shadow and the, and the weight of history, um, this was an iron ballast block that was used to counterbalance the weight of enslaved people on board ships um, that came um, from Africa. And this particular ship um, left Mozambique and actually sank, and they um, excavated these ballasts from it. And it sank in 1794, um, close to Cape Town. Uh, in South Africa. Um, here are some child's iron shackles which were made before 1680. Um, and they were used as restraints around arms and legs. And um, I don't know if you can see in the photograph, but the metal is incredibly coarse. And this would have kind of cut into, into these children's skins for, for the months that they were at sea. And um, children made up 26% of the captives that were brought over. And I think because the, you know, it's, it's just really, really heavy subject matter, but it's so important to kind of engage with it. 
This is a Low Country basket um, from the 19th century. And when I was looking through the list of artifacts, I didn't see anything that kind of appeared to be an act of resistance. A lot of the pieces I was kind of going to photograph were documents of sale or of you know, the ballast, um, the shackles, and I really wanted to kind of display some sort of act of resistance that was continually happening um, from, uh, from, from the enslaved people. And so this is a coiled woven basket that was used to separate grains and unhusks during harvest and were a form of artistry um, and technology brought from Africa to the colonies. And although, although they kind of seem utilitarian, they also served as a source of artistic pride um, and a way for, for people to stay connected to the culture and the memory of the homeland. And so I'm really happy that we agreed to kind of include this artifact into, into the work that we made. Now, I had a sleepless night thinking about making this photograph. This is a daguerreotype, and if you've ever seen a daguerreotype, it's incredibly reflective. And with all of the lights that were happening, we had only 30 minutes to work with this object because of the sensitivity to light and because of its artifactual nature that I was incredibly worried about making this work, but it, it all worked out fine. And um, as you can see in the image, um, this woman is called Rhoda Phillips, and her name was officially written down for the first time in 1832 uh, in a record of her sale. And she was purchased at one years old with her mother, who was called Miley, and her sister Martha um, for $550. Um, and she was bequeathed to her family um, after her original owner, Thomas Gleaves, died, and she was valued at $200. Um, and she remained enslaved until the Emancipation Proclamation, which was in 1863. And after that, she married, and, and she had a family. Um, usually, when you see a daguerreotype of, of a black person, um, you know, usually you would see um, it accompanied usually by a white child um, or in the background of a, of a family photo to kind of emphasize this, this servitude. Um, and I think her story kind of really highlights the perversities of slavery. Um, you know, she was actually seen as a person by the family that owned her, but they actually owned her, so it's definitely compromised. And this is Jacob Johns. Um, we're kind of not 100% sure whether he was enslaved, recently freed, or a freed man when he enlisted in the army. And he was a sergeant in the 19th United States Colored Troops Infantry Company B. And again, kind of being in the presence of these objects kind of made me think about myself as this young girl in the UK and kind of coming this whole journey to kind of standing in front of these objects and what that actually meant for my ancestors. And then this last image is of a sugarcane cutter. It's metal and wood, it was made in the 19th century. Um, you know, in the descriptions, one of the things that came, came out to me was that the lifespan of a, of a person, and say person working on a sugar plantation, was as little as seven years. Um, so yeah, it's definitely been a difficult project, but such a rewarding project to be on. And, and like I say, it really has, has kind of informed me when I think about the work that I am making right now and that I want to make in the future. Um, there was an inability to touch any of the items, and it made me think about haptic and about touch and about this length and about access that is granted to and this ownership kind of going back to the ownership of black bodies. Um, and again, this uni universal narrative of the African diaspora. So I do have some new projects, but I'm not quite ready to, to share them just yet. Um, but just to say that I'm continuing 
this exploration of identity. Um, one of the things that I'm working on right now is this multiplicity in identity. Um, working with vernacular photography, I, about five years ago, I purchased a lot of African-American photographs from eBay, which I began to sort through at a residency that I was at in uh, Marin at the Headlands. And the amount of information that is included on the back of these photographs makes me feel that I can actually find some relatives of the ancestors and return these photographs back to them. And so I'm working on that. Also some self-portraiture. I'm ready to turn the camera onto myself and, and kind of think about my own identity, actually. Um, and also the translation of photo photography into different mediums, such as clay. I'm using some self-portraits and pulling them into 3D printing software, which, which creates a mold that I can imprint, imprint excuse me, into clay. And thinking about these renditions and these objects um, and how to present them and display them. Okay, so I've tried to cover as much as possible in my practice and process. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have for me. Thank you. Yes. Yes. I mean, I think that when anyone looks at a piece of art, you bring yourself to that viewing and that, you know, it is your experience and your understanding that kind of informs how you experience any piece of art, as well as the artist statement, of course. So I, there's nothing really, it's difficult to think about that. I mean, obviously I, I I do want the understanding of historical portrayals to come through the work and that, that this is an elevation of women from the African diaspora, which I think is automatically, potentially automatically already translated in the work. But really, it's probably this humanity, I think, is really what, I'm, what I, th I think I'm kind of burrowing through in my work, is that, that there is space for each each person and that experiences should be valued. I think that, you know, for me, I'm thinking about the black experience. But it, it's very difficult to think about what one person should learn. I think there's so many, I think maybe more questions um, should arise from the work than necessarily answers. Okay. Oh, there's a question at the back. Sorry. <laughs> I know you said you gave some direction, but not a lot. Yes. Anything in particular you said to your collaborators about facial expression? I mean, I always dislike a smile within my photographs. I think it's very forced. And when I think about nature, I think if an animal shows you their teeth, it's normally an act of aggression. Or it's somehow, <laughs> in humanity, it's become this like, act of happiness. Um, so that's the main thing. We, we would talk a lot about experiences. And I would ask people to kind of sit in an experience. And, th and then that would kind of be this kind of unknown thing that would happen in, in the image. Thank you. There's a lot of internal um, things in, in all of my work. Um, yeah. Yes, right at the back. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. I, I, it's definitely, um, 
this self-discovery through all of my work. Um, you know, when I think back to the time when I was making the work, I felt that the transition from the UK to the States has kind of rendered me in this position of invisibility and or this questionable presence. And so the work is really responding to this element of myself and this idea that I could collaborate and through the work kind of build community and elevate us all together. Yes. I, I fell in love with an American, so uh, I, yeah, I know, it's, uh, I, I really, I think what is so interesting is that I really, I see this as my home now, I also see the UK as my home, so I'm in this, I feel like in a way I'm this perfect example of, of what is diaspora, um, Yeah, sorry, one more question, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I would just keep making work. The most important thing is practice and kind of putting yourself in uncomfortable positions can make you a better photographer. And that's one of the reasons why I enjoy kind of the stranger interaction is because there is this tension that maybe I see as making me work harder and make better images. So just keep practicing and you know, don't be hard on yourself, you know, don't, don't listen to that inner negative voice, just keep making work and keep sharing it too. Find a community that you can share your work in. Okay, all right, yes, I think we're gonna go downstairs. Okay.